next speaker, uh, Micaela Popa Wyatt from the University of Barcelona. Uh, the title of the talk is Slurs, Rules, and Power. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and very happy to participate in the great discussion on, on, on slurs and hate speech today. So, um, Actually, there is a variability in all of those effects of humiliation, silencing, and disempowering. So, and the first contribution of the talk would be to kind of identify three kinds of variable events. The first one has already been discussed. It's a variation across different slur words. Yeah, uh, if you uh, slurs for the same group. Django, uh, when Steve Wallace is, is, is calling his in-group uh, uh, fellows with the uh, So, and that's still more offensive than another in-group use when an African American is uh, calling another African American person, yo, and they are, what's up? So, where is, the, 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 the slur word has been reclaimed and it's been put to a, like a friendly non-commercial use. So, is to, to see why is it that different audience members 
might be mildly racist, or as little bigots might not be offended at all. So, I like to think of this, this kind of, uh, what's going on in this kind of variation as a sort of difference between the evaluation that is expressed by this lore and how the audience appreciates whether it's appropriate or not. So you would have a variation whether people would think that uh, it's more appropriate or not. Um, so we got BT1 variation across words, BT2 variation across uses, and BT3 variation across audience members. What's the essence of this explanation? And uh, my suggestion is, is going to be that power is going to play an important role. And um, so power and status are very important features in all social life. Uh, but power can be abused or dislocated. So my angle would be to say that what slurs do is to try to create or maintain a power imbalance between the speaker and the target group. And uh, the explanation is going to be that this variation um, in offense will be correlated with the variation with the degree uh, in the power imbalance that is uh, the slur attempts to create. Uh, not that this is not making the statement that there is or there ought to be such a power imbalance between the speaker and the target group, but nevertheless, the bigot in uttering this slur, she's trying to, to create such a power imbalance, not socially directly, but at least within the discourse to start with. And so, in one sense, I'm going to argue that like, the, the, the slurring act is like a discourse move that seeks to alter power imbalance in the discourse. And um, so this is not an explanation like um, properly on a linguistic level, it's moving beyond at the discourse level and is trying to explain the, the variable offense in terms of the sociological facts that, that go into it. So what's the essence of the explanation of this batch? I'm going to say that um, Obviously not all slurs, but some that I call oppressive slurs are, um, um, are not just about expressing content. So expressing content is what is fundamental to all, all slurs, but some slurs are more offensive than others. And the explanation for that is, I take it, in, in their kind of trying to, to achieve oppression. So a big will seek to achieve an unjust harm, and that's not a mere description of an oppressed state. So it's trying to do something in the world, albeit indirectly. And I'm going to argue this is achieved by an act of role assignment, of assigning a discourse role, not a social role. And this, the, the, the goal of the, this act is to achieve a power imbalance in the discourse. So what's going on is that the, the bigot is taking on the role of the powerful in the discourse while assigning the target a powerless subordinate role. Um, and for this power imbalance to be to have an effect in the discourse, it must be plausible. And how's it going to be plausible? It's going to be plausible pretty much by what other people have suggested so far, that we need to draw upon like a history of oppression and uh, the power imbalance that is enacted in this force reflects a power imbalance uh, between the target and the group and the, and the oppressor group. And we're going to see that it can rely on existing power imbalance or it can be one. Uh, so what's a role, first of all? Uh, and we need to say like how it can be assigned, how what happens when the role, a role is assigned, and why is this notion of power imbalance in the roles with explanation of variable events? Um, let's start with roles. So those are social constructs or social scripts, or we we'll talk about role schemas. Uh, they are contain information about permissible and expected behavior, uh, about, about social status, and it comes with uh, rights and responsibilities that we know. Um, uh, and they also define like how we expect other people to behave and how we think that they should behave. Uh, for Goffman, who kind of introduces this notion, um, uh, he thinks that roles are the basic unity of socialization. It is through roles that tasks 
and society are allocated in a way to meant to enforce their performance. And it's very obvious to me that roles are important, important uh, aspects socially. They provide predictable behavior. So knowing what role you have, I'm, 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 I, I will know what to expect and how, how to make predictions about how our conversation or interactions will proceed. So, so knowledge of one's role in interaction and that of the other is like what, what drives our, uh, our social interactions. And they also define power and status relations. So being in a, in a certain position in society, you may have various roles associated with certain uh, uh, status, um, um, and that will, um, uh, that will, that will uh, explain our interactions and what we expect one of the other. Uh, another important feature of roles is that a, a change in a role uh, can cause power change. That if you lose or gain a role, you will lose or gain power. And also, importantly, utterances or uh, acts can change social roles. So I'm thinking in um, of Austin's performatives, uh, like uh, when a priest uh, declares men and wife, or a judge declares someone guilty murderer and so on, he will allocate a social role uh, to that person that will, that will continue uh, uh, along his life. So uh, that's allocation of a social, let's think of it in terms of like long-term role. Uh, and everyone would know you that you are a murderer or um, uh, married. Uh, but I want to argue that slurs don't work on this battle. They're not quite like Austin's idea of performatives, or what we also call predictives or resortatives. Those work fine in cases like more institutional or uh, legal cases, uh, say uh, an arbitrary law, like saying uh, last time we're permitted to vote. Um, that, like in, in, in Langton's uh, work, is treated like, as performing a resortative. Uh, Price, uh, lapse last for from, from their uh, right to vote. But I want to argue slurs are not like that. Uh, they don't assign a social role, a long-term social role to the target. You don't all of a sudden become oppressed just because I, I, I slurred you. Um, or you don't take on the characteristics that the bigot uh, assigned to the target. What goes on instead is, I mean, the, the, why I think this is um, not not a plausible uh, route to take is that bigots don't have power. They're not in a position to to subordinate directly. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more subtle than that. Um, and there is no convention such that a, a slurring act will perform this act of subordination. Uh, However, a slurring act is more than just normal speech acts, assertions or questions and so on. It's just it's not so much. It's, it's, so a slurring act is not just saying that the targets are contemptible, and yet they are less powerful than a performative. They're somewhere in between. And I think that this notion of discourse roles aims precisely at the capture of this in between state. So what would that be? Um, a little bit more about discourse roles. Um, it's, in a way, they're kind of uh, as an instantiation of the social roles that we normally have in, in real life within the discourse. And we can manipulate them or shape them via our conversation and, and the, the relations of power, subordination that we can, we can achieve through discourse. Uh, so think of discourse roles as inheriting yeah, characteristics from their social roles. But they need not be always. Yeah? They can be play acted or they can be uh, uh, just instantiated on the fly. Um, and some examples are like um, they typically come in pair, like a boss and an uh, employee or a parent and a child, a student and a teacher and so on. So they come in pairs and typically they are uh, the relationship
relationship between them are mutually accepted. We each know what roles we are in. Um, but they can also be play acted, just for the purposes of the discourse. I can take on the role of the victim in order to seek sympathy and so on. So I can do a lot of things for discourse by drawing on what we know of the social roles. Um, and as I said, they're typically accepted by the parties, but they can also be forced upon someone who doesn't want to take a role. So this is what I think is going on pretty much in, in, in slurry facts. You want to, to allocate the target in a powerless or in a role. Uh, you just kind of forcefully, willfully. Uh, I know you're gonna, you don't like it, but this is how I play the game. And you're going to take this role. So, um, and another feature is that discourse roles exist uh, only for the duration of the discourse. Uh, uh, unlike social roles, um, they're not, they don't persist through time. They're not the long, long-term social roles. But they are infected and infect um, um, social roles um, sooner or later. And the important feature, actually, is that the discourse role can change during the discourse. So by making certain moves in the discourse, I can allocate someone, uh, I, I, I can alter the discourse roles. And with the discourse roles, I said, we also have information about their rights and responsibilities. And um, so, um, and that would determine how the conversation will proceed, depending on what role you are in. Um, so, now we've seen what discourse roles are, and uh, then an act of role of, of, of assigning a discourse role is simply allocating a role for the purposes and duration of the conversation. And that's a short-term social role. Uh, it doesn't really change your, uh, your, your social role. Uh, but it's more than just an, an assertion that you ought to have this social role. And it also changes the discourse rules because depending on what roles you have, you will be allowed to do or say certain things, but not allowed to do or say other things. So it affects the permissibility facts of the conversation. And it also affects how the utterances of, of the targets will be interpreted, say, after the conversation. Um, so just to see an example of, of how one's uh, discourse roles can kind of uh, change through a conversation, this is um, uh, an example from uh, In the Hit of the Night. So you have uh, a Simon Poitier uh, character, he's Mr. Tibbs, he's uh, an African-American people, uh, uh, man and, and, and the Miss 
Additional slurs of the target is a sign of powerless subordinate discourse role. Uh, but that's not a, a real role, a, a real role. Uh, and it's not saying that the target ought to have a social role, uh, because it's rather trying to 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 um, to allocate the target in that role for the purposes of the discourse. Um, so what's changing is a discourse role, not a social role. Uh, and a key feature is that uh, slurring doesn't attempt uh, uh, just to affect the target and say that he's in a powerless role. The bigot also aims to, to assume a powerful role for himself. So what's really going on in, in slurs is that uh, um, uh, it is a power grab. The bigot is trying to reduce power, to take away power from the target, but uh, it, it, while also grabbing power for himself. Um, so the idea is that this was rules assignment changes the power balance in the conversation. And especially like if you are in a room and nobody fights back against the slur, you just feel how power has transitioned from the target to to, to the bigot, and uh, somehow it's it, it's like also a demonstration of power that I, I'm going to do this and and I'm going to get away with it because nobody's going to challenge me. Uh, that's not to say that in a way like um, the slurring act.
extra element of, of power imbalance. Uh, so we can think that those slurs that are able to track salient aggressive effects um, will be the, the, most, uh, the most offensive. Uh, but uh, there are also cases where the, the, um, the target groups will be in you know, a equal, say, power uh, uh, balance, power relations like uh, Irish calling the British a Brit or calling the Scottish Scot uh, uh, Jock and so on. And there are also uh, at the bottom of this continuum we will have cases where um, like uh, Honky Gringo and Li uh, Limey where actually um, whether or not there is an attempt to power grab, there is, uh, there is the, the, um, the, the, as it were, the expression of personal contempt that kind of carries the force of the, of the, of the, um, of the slur, but it will be less offensive than the ones that can go upon an existing power balance. Uh, how about the variation across uh, uses? So um, we said that ingroup uses are less offensive or non-offensive uh, relative to other group uses because the power imbalance is is less plausible or implausible. So uh, this is because like uh, an ingroup uses the speaker just doesn't fit the role of the oppressor, so the role assignment doesn't apply to the public. Uh, uh, and um, we might go if I own a ligature to, 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 to explain how this uh, non-directory meaning is arrived at. Um, um, so that, that's also what, what explains uh, replay in the sense that because the role assignments that the speaker is taking and the, uh, the target is assigned to don't fire correctly, this opens the possibility of the replay. Uh, because, um, but it's also interesting why, why um, as a white, uh, white person, you still can't use the, uh, the slur, um, the N-word, um, uh, as we're friendly, not pretentiously. And that's because the role assigned um, uh, the role, the, the role assigned, sorry, the role that as a speaker you are fit for is still is still is still up for um, um, it still invokes the role of the oppressor. So even when you try to be friendly using the N word, you can't succeed because you, by virtue of your group membership, you invoke the role of the oppressor. Uh, so. Uh, in terms of the variation across audience members, the idea would be here that um, you are actually offended to the degree uh, you think the power imbalance is inappropriate. So if you are, say, a moderately bigoted, uh, uh, you will be uh, mildly offended. Uh, uh, and if you are a strong non-racist,
multiple uses of, of, of sores. Uh, you have metaphors or other pieces that Robin looked at. Uh, but I actually haven't thought about it. I mean, because one, yeah, I'd like to see an example. But the difficulty I have here is that I mean, indeed, is a tool for criticizing, for ridiculing something that is you know, not working. Uh, but um, what what is it that we uh, that an ironic use of the slurring word could criticize? It, it, it's, it's, I mean, you have the uses in rap songs or like movies or any uh, or like stand up comedies and so on, where like the slur is put on the table to reflect about its function.
question. I was like, there, that there is the discrimination against African Americans, and that, that's like a call that people talk about insular appropriation. It's not quite reclaimed, so the word is still like in its EP stage. It's not <laughs> purely purely sanitized. But you would have, yeah. I mean, the the the, the, the variety depending on the word in terms of their is a word success of the reclamation process will depend pretty much, um, I guess, also on the on the, the real the reality and the, the like the, the, the power dynamics or the, the struggle that the group is still suffering. Claudia, can you make it a uh, half a minute? No. to make this quick um, judgment about your possible role. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know. Then the second one is like, uh, we're equals. Yeah, no, and I understand then, how, yeah, yeah. David, it, how you used it as an example to exemplify the changing yeah. um, power relations okay. between us. But my question, I thought your thesis was is that slurs and not Uh, and I'm, it's kind of 
of struggling with this idea of how to explain the direct uses and indirect uses because in direct uses the force is even uh, higher, um, like stronger than indirect uses when we just talk about the, the targets. But coming back, so for me that's an implicating act and this, the, it's n not necessarily tied to the semantics. It's, it's um, an implicating act for the, uh, this short term social goal, powerless according to the goal, um, for the purposes of the discourse and the immigration of the discourse, um, that need not be part of the semantics. 